Hey everyone, welcome back to the next commentary, director, me, boy, I can't talk today, director's commentary for DCU Classics by me, Scott, Toy Guru Nightly. I'm your host and your former brand manager, and today we're talking about the second wave of Green Lantern DCU Classics, which, why was Green Lantern getting his own wave, in fact, two own waves of DCU Classics? Well, I mean, you know, it should be pretty obvious, right? Green Lantern is by far the most well-known and coolest of all the DC superheroes, and Hal Jordan is the most appreciated of all of them, and he deserved to have his own live-action movie. And he got it. He got his own movie in 2011, and we were geared up to make this an amazing toyetic movie. It had everything a toy line should have, and then the movie didn't do too well. But... To get everyone excited for the movie before it came out, we did two waves of Green Lantern Classics figures. So quick roll call on who those were, Sodom Yacht. We had our pet pack with Badge and Dexstar and uh, Despotilius, the, uh, the virus. We had Metaphil, who could also be not Kello with a quick head swap. Loved doing this. We had our Red Lanterns, Skalex, and of course the infamous Night Lick. Now I know if, how people pronounce my name. Carol Ferris, known as Star Sapphire, the frenemy, girl frenemy. And then Gahoo, our movie preview figure. So a very interesting wave with a lot going on. So let's dive in. So the previous wave we had done, wave one of Green Lantern Classics, had a swappable head and hand figure in the terms of MASH, um, the yellow, the, the yellow lanterns, the Sinestro Core characters. And this worked really, really well. So we wanted to expand this for Wave 2 and do some more Green Lanterns who could share a common body. And we chose two characters that had the same feet, meaning they had the two toed feet, and those characters being Metaphil and Matt Kellogg. And that was basically why they got chosen, because they both had two-toed feet. And, of course, because they both had interesting heads as well, which was going to be the key difference. They would use the standard male buck body with those new feet and have a head that really brought out their character. The heads on action figures were like 90% of the characterization comes from on any character. So Metaphil here, who is, I guess, kind of like the Groot of the Green Lantern Corps, it's funny how when the, when this toy came out and I said Groot, like most of America would be like, who the heck is Groot? Now everybody knows who that is. Maybe he's an Ent. How many more popular culture references can I make to tree people? I don't know. Whether he looks like a tree or he looks like a stalk of broccoli, he's he actually is a really cool visual background Green Lantern character. And besides the whole two-toed thing, the two, two toes, not two toads, like a frog, uh, you know, he had a very great visual look for his head. And as did his partner in crime, not Kello. Kello? 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 Am I pronouncing that right? So not to be confused with Abe Sapien from Hellboy lore, this fishy character also was going to appear in the movie, and at the time we actually thought was going to have a very prominent part in the movie. So doing him as one of these figures was a no-brainer at the time. And hey, anytime you can do like a fish character with a fish bowl on him, that just makes a very cool toy. I mean, I always talk about characters being toyetic. And doing characters that were kind of background Green Lanterns, we wanted to do characters that were really going to stand out. And even though we didn't do the 60s version with the with, with the real fishbowl, the round fishbowl, uh, he still came out really cool in this modern version. All right, next up, Carol Ferris, the star sapphire. Who is this one? Well... Uh, she has a dual role in DC Universe. Star Sapphire is not only one of Hal Jordan's kind of original arch enemies, using her uh, her Star Sapphire zapping power to uh, take Hal down there with a yellow lightning bolt, because we all know you know yellow destroys green. Actually, they did a good job of explaining why that is in the continuity, but that's not important. The point is is that Carol Ferris, who is the Star Sapphire character is not only one of Hal Jordan's arch enemies, she's also his girlfriend, or his, you know, on-again, on off-again girlfriend, his Vicki Vale, his Lois Lane, his uh, Mary Jane Parker, and, you know, sometimes she's also Serena from Gossip Girl. You just never know when she's going to pop up next. 
I mean, heck, she's even Mrs. Ryan Reynolds now, isn't she? Wow, yeah, that's uh, that's one good-looking couple there. Uh, all right, Star Sapphire, where was I? So she's had a huge variety of looks over the years. It's, a lot of elements have stayed consistent, but for the toy, we were really going to go for the modern look, again, because of the whole Blackest Night, Sinestro Core War event that was happening in the comics at the time. Fans were going to want the version that they saw on the page, so that's why she's in her modern outfit and not in her 1960s outfit, which maybe we could have done down the line, but... We didn't. Red lanterns. So again, what are red lanterns? We're getting all these different colored lanterns, purple lanterns, and yellow lanterns, and green lanterns. And the whole idea, for those of you not in the know, is that this whole Sinestro Core War, Blackest Night storyline that was going on in the comics at the time, all the different colors of the rainbow had different emotional connections. Green being willpower, yellow, fear, and red, anger. I bet the Hulk would have been a great red lantern. So they were led by a character named Atrocitus, excuse me, they're always hard to pronounce, and uh, yeah, they, they vomit red blood. We eventually did do an Atrocitus figure in the Signature series, uh, he had a little bit more tooling to him, but for this wave of Green Lantern classics, in order to represent the Red Lanterns, who were kind of the enemy du jour at the moment, having sort of just appeared in the comics, and were being set up as, as you know, a major force of evil. We wanted to go with, again, much like those, like the Nataloi and Metaphil, Red Lanterns that were going to be very visually compelling and stand out as toys. And Scalix was a great choice. He's kind of like a uh, cow skull-headed Red Lantern, shall we say. And he would also use the basic human body, which, again, was, was kind of a... Uh, important aspect was the shared body. The other Red Lantern has a little bit more of a story behind him. So this is Red Lantern Nightlick. Yes, that's, I'm Scott Nightlick. I'm going to explain why he has my name. So he is a character from the comics. I mean, he's legit, although uh, I think we were kind of, I don't want to say led to believe, but it, it was implied that he was going to have a much bigger role in the comics than just maybe showing up in the background in a few panels. But hey, he's there. He's legitimate. So he makes the encyclopedia, right? Okay, so why is this character named after me, and how did he come to be? The original intent for this character was we wanted to honor the Four Horsemen. They had been sculpting figures since day one, and in addition to doing the DC Universe, they also sculpted a lot of their own original characters, namely the figures from Gothtropolis, and they now do a Mythic Legions line. They're extremely talented, and what is kind of cool is their designs, when they do original characters, do often have, shall we say, similar design elements to them. Meaning, you know, if you put a figure in front of someone, you could be like, yes, that's a Four Horsemen designed figure. And we went to Warner Brothers in DC and pitched this idea of the Horsemen creating an original Red Lantern. So the other side of this story is doing the Green Lantern movie, I became good friends with Jeff Johns, who was the writer of the comic book and also the executive producer of the film. And basically, we're both fanboys at heart. You know, we were lucky enough to work in the industry, but we also... Our, you know, we, we read the comics, we collect the toys, um, and Jeff and his wife Sonia and myself and my wife Barbara, the four of us all became good friends and uh, would have dinner and, uh, you know, all sorts of things. So, really great guy. He, uh, and I'm, one of the reasons I miss being in L.A. is being around friends like that. Anyway, the point being is that, so Jeff and I became friends, and when it came time to naming this character, we were in a meeting at Warner Brothers in a consumer products building, and suddenly Jeff just like pokes his head in and just says, oh, hey, the new Red Lantern that the Horseman created. You know what we're naming him? We're naming him Nightlick. And I was like, oh, God, the fans are going to have a field day with this one. But, hey, you know, that was kind of Jeff's little, I guess you could say, gift to me. Um, maybe payback for the Sir Laserlot figure uh, that I got it made in the Motu Classics line. But that's a video for another time. And uh, the whole Nightlick concept also came from the big tongues on his hand and the fact that all those bones he's got on his, uh, you know, across his chest are things that he's collected because I am a collector. I'm a toy collector. So the idea was this Knight Lick character was also a collector and collected the bones of his villains. Whew, yeah, that's kind of scary and creepy. And if I was going to have a character named after me, I'm not sure if I would have gone for something so gross, but I'm really honored. And honestly, I, I appreciate that Jeff did this as a, as a kind gesture for all the work I put into the line. So... Hey, Jeff, thank you, if you're listening. All right, 
Green Lantern. It's a Green Lantern wave, so we got to get back to green characters, and that's going to be Sodom Yacht. And for those of you not familiar with good old Mr. Yacht, so he is also called Ion, which was the most powerful Green Lantern. In fact, there was a prophecy that Sodom Yacht was going to be the last Green Lantern. And this is going back to an 80s story that Michael, not Michael Moore, Alan Moore wrote. Uh, Alan Moore as in Watchmen, Alan Moore. And he even, you know, he did appear even in, in Flash Forwards and in future comics like Legion of Superheroes where y Sodom Yacht did show up as the last Green Lantern, fulfilling that prophecy that Alan Moore had created in Tiger Tiger, a short story he wrote about the Green Lanterns. Abin Sur discovers this prophecy that this character at um, Sodom Yacht is eventually going to become the most powerful, and that's going to happen in the future. And then nothing kind of happened with that for 20 years. And then Jeff Johns, being the writer of Green Lantern at the time, and you know, I'm not just plugging him because we're friends, but he, he really is a very smart guy with lore. He basically took this, uh, this Alan Moore short story, Tiger, Tiger, and, ex and, and, and just basically had it actually happen in the current comic books in 2009 through 2011. So Sodom Yacht became Ion, and uh, that was it. All right, now it was time for the Chipmunk. And I'm not talking about the Rescue Rangers as much as I'm a huge fan of Disney Afternoon. The Chipmunk, well, he's not really a Chipmunk because he's an alien, but he looks like a Chipmunk. He looks like an Earth-based Chipmunk. This character is Badge, B-D-G, and he came packaged with Dexstar and Despot, Despot, Despotilius. Ooh, I can't even say that one. And while he's not actually a chipmunk, he obviously has a huge resemblance to a chipmunk, which makes him very toyetic and very easy to turn into consumer products. Now, the original version of a chipmunk, Green Lantern, was a character named Chip. But Chip wasn't around at the time. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But even though Chip is sort of the more iconic version, and even back in the 60s, he looked a little bit more like a cartoon character with his, with his bow tie and his big feet and you know, his eyes. And then by the 80s, he was kind of looking more raccoony, um, but a little bit more, you know, vicious and a little bit more aggressive than he looked like a Looney Tune in the 60s. But Chip, unfortunately, like many chipmunks and squirrels, had a run-in with a car, and let's just say he was no more. So he got replaced by Badge, B-D-G, and Warner Brothers wanted us very much to do the Badge character, not Chip, because Badge was the current Chipmunk Green Lantern. Again, not an actual chipmunk. Then, as far as pairing him up, since he was a small figure, he got paired up with Dexstar, the Red Lantern. So, as I noted earlier, Red Lanterns get their power from anger, much as Green Lanterns from willpower. And anytime you got an angry blue cat, you're going to have to make merchandise out of it. I mean, he's got his ring on his tail, for goodness sake. Isn't he so cute? He just wants to rip your head off. And if you told me we were going to do a blue cat that vomited it up blood <laughs> when I started this whole thing, I would have been like, yeah, right. The interesting thing about Dexstar, he's, he's actually the Earth Red Lantern, like how Jordan is the Earth Green Lantern. So I, I, if I recall the backstory, Dexstar's um, family abuses him or, or something like that, uh, you know, maybe leaves with him without food, and so he gets revenge on them and kills them, and he's a very angry cat. And so he gets recruited as the Earth representative to the Red Lantern Corps and uh, does the whole vomiting blood thing and red energy. And, uh, and that's Dexstar. And, you know, I mean, he, he, he gets made into a lot of merchandise because, you know, he's a cat. Following that, to complete the trilogy of sort of, uh, I wouldn't call them pets, but maybe sidekick-sized figures, was the virus Yellow Lantern Despotilus Despotilus. So Yellow Lanterns, as you may recall from the last video, are fear-based, or you know, the emotion of fear warriors that Sinestro recruits when he starts the Sinestro Corps. And uh, one of them is a little virus character, and you know he does evil virusy things. So when we had the idea that we wanted to do a pack of sidekicks, which, man, I wish we got to do that again. That was so much fun. Such an original, cool concept. Even though they all became fully tooled, uh, because they were smaller, it was easier to sort of fully tool them all together. All right, rounding out this wave was a very unique figure, which was Gahoo. Who? Gahoo. 
So this was a figure from the movie. It was a movie sneak peek figure, which was a concept I stole from Hasbro that would always do sneak peek figures for Star Wars for all of the prequels. Uh, not so much for the Disney movies, but back in the prequel days they were doing that. And we thought it would be really great to do one of the background Green Lanterns as a sneak peek figure to get people excited for the movie. So while Gahu wasn't a huge figure in the comics, was really a background character, and we didn't really know how much of an appearance he would have in the movies, we, we really liked the design. He had those tentacles carried over from his comic book look, and he was going to be a great sneak peek figure. Now the issue with this is we had this movie figure in an otherwise comic book lineup, and to say the fans were angry and angry at me personally is an understatement. Boy, people were not happy we did this, that we put a a movie figure into a comic book wave. But, I mean, if you look at Marvel Legends, this is standard operating procedure now. And in fact, this is how Marvel Legends was able to be saved at retail. It's not one assortment of Marvel Legends throughout the year. It's a movie assortment that hangs with the movie product and also has comic book characters in it. It's literally how Marvel Legends has survived by doing this. But at the time, this was pretty much unheard of, and all assortments were either movie or comic book. The idea of combining them, like, again, Marvel Legends does all the time, was pretty unheard of, and we got a lot of pushback. I'd like to say we were pioneers. I'm going to go with that over, you know, trying to intentionally piss off the fans, which, you know, we never try to do. But I'm going to go with pioneers. We were pioneering new ways of distributing figures by having a movie figure in a comic book figure wave. How's that? You buying it? I don't know if I'm buying it, but, you know, hey, it's what happened, and, uh, that was the whole wave. Well, of course, the whole wave, except for that giant guy you see behind everyone there. So that was our Build-A-Figure, Stell. Big figure, you know, stood head and head, head uh, a whole, like, sort of body over a regular figure, as far as height-wise. Stell was also a character that was going to appear in the movie. And again, at the time, he didn't know how much of his role he would have. Turned out all of the kind of non-how Green Lanterns were pretty much cantina aliens in the movie, meaning they were just in the background except for, you know, Kilowog and uh, Toma Ray. And Stell, in particular, had gone through quite a transformation in the movie. Uh, his original look was thrown out at the last minute, and he was completely redesigned digitally, since he was always a digital character, to look more like the comic book. So if you look at the Green Lantern movie line, you'll see the Stell figure we did was based on his original look, because that we worked, you know, three hours, three hours, three years in advance. So the early concept art is what became the figure. But in the comic book, he's more humanoid, less, you know, insectoid robot. And, I mean, I, I love robots. I'm a huge robot fan. And this gave us a robot buck, too, which we then got to reuse for characters like Stripe. And while Stell has had many looks over the years, sometimes a little more boxy, sometimes a little bit more robotic, other times more humanoid, we really, again, went with the modern look, like with Star Sapphire, of the version that was in the comics at the time. And, you know, i got to say, a robot, a, 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 you know, an artificial being that has willpower to wield the Green Lantern ring, I mean, that's like a concept that really makes you go, hmm, like he's using, this robot is using willpower to fight as a Green Lantern. And I, I love this toy. He still sits on my desk, like right next to my computer. He's awesome. He really came out great. The whole wave did. I'm really glad we did this. The movie, while it underperformed a little bit, it's still awesome, and I love that I got to be part of it.